Awesome. Hey, Paul, uh, welcome to the uh, podcast for Ask IoT. Uh, this is an informal series just to get a perspective from enterprise buyers in terms of um, what they're looking uh, for from an IoT perspective as they kind of navigate the IoT journey. Uh, so happy to have you. So why don't we start with some introductions? Uh, why don't you tell me about a little bit about yourself, although we've sure. been on each other for over 10 years. Uh, love for the audience to learn more about you. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, currently, I'm at uh, Eaton, a uh, large company around power, intelligent power management, and I lead up uh, their digital initiatives for the electrical sector. So it's about uh, $17 billion of our $23 billion business um, and focused on data centers, utilities, commercial buildings, industrial, uh, as well as working with OEMs who are installing our um, components and devices in their machines. And um, really responsible for commercialization of what our digital solutions are. And so obviously there's a lot of IoT there. Um, I've been here for almost two years. Uh, prior to that, uh, I spent about eight years with, with Emerson in a number of different roles. Um, again, product management, um, solution strategy, so pre-sales and, and helping our customers out how to understand how to use the solutions. And then got into uh, a little bit of the portfolio management and m and And um, way back when, uh, gosh, 10 years ago, I left a software as a service company called Verise. Um, we, uh, I was there from 2006 to 2013, and uh, we took that from a, a relatively small company, about four to five million dollars, up to about uh, 22 million, and sold the private equity. and And I exited at that time. So um, prior to that, spent time uh, with a, as a customer. So I was actually in a grocery retailer, trying to solve this energy and the maintenance things that uh, were important for us. And then started my career early on with uh, Johns Control, so in the automation and control business. So I was in M to M before it was called IoT. So uh, it's been a long, long time. Yeah, I, I think you were doing M to M before it was called M to M. Whatever it was called before then, you know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think you've been doing this since ever since the internet. So yeah, <laughs> I'm not quite that old, but pretty close. I remember having my first. Uh, 9600 baud modem in college that I thought I was pretty cool. So um, yeah, that's awesome. Changed. No, no, that's great. That's uh, it's hard to find folks that have kind of seen the entire um, IoT journey. Uh, but uh, are there two or three things that stand out to you from your implementations that you want to talk about, like what you did at Emerson or, or what you're doing right now from uh, Eaton perspective, data center, uh, two to three things that you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I think, you know, Unfortunately, I think one of, and, and it's probably part of another conversation too, but part of the difficulty with IoT is that everybody tends to be focused on the technology. You know, what's the latest and greatest technology without having solved the use case issue and the value. And so I've seen that go through so many different iterations and, and whether it's been at Emerson or even now, you know, data for the sake of data is I think where a lot of people start on IoT and it creates uh, a mountain of problems and a mountain of cost structures that are unsupportable and unsustainable over time. And so, you know, for me, I'm, I'm very focused. And if you ask my executives, the things that they always ask me, what's the value, what's the value, what's the value? Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, as technologists, we can get enthralled with the technology. And then, you know, I think uh, Apple is, done a great thing for technology, but it's also, I think, left a false impression of if you just build it, they will come. And so people tend to focus on on those aspects without really questioning whether or not there's a use case there. So I've seen that, you know, I saw that at Emerson where um, we were heavily involved with the monitoring and control of refrigeration systems in a grocery retailer. So mm -hmm. you have this weird mix of and, and dichotomy, if you will, of a retail environment and an industrial environment coming together. And, and now at, at Eaton, you know, we're dealing with complex issues for our customers and really related to gray boxes, whether it's the transformer or the, the medium voltage assembly or the motor control center or a transformer that have largely been gray boxes that have just worked for 20 years. And now you're saying you want to add some complexity to that and some monitoring of that. And so if the use case isn't clear, it becomes an additional cost to uh, mm -hmm. what you're offering is without much value. And so I think that's been a repeated theme. I know that you and I had those discussions way back when, which is, mm -hmm. is the value really clear? Because the technology can come along with that. But I think if, if there's one thing I would express is, 
is the value. Um, the second thing is where should you process the data? And mm -hmm. you, know, you think about a thick edge client or a thin edge client, and I think it's gone through different iterations. And I think that's a big important discussion nowadays is where should the processing of data and what data needs to really go to the cloud, what, what remains at a device um, mm -hmm. and, and having that understanding. And, and really the third part is, is there an awareness of what you're really signing up to do when mm -hmm. you go down this IoT journey? And in my past life, many times we were creating a IoT capability for a third party through, for a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, how are you going to deal with technical support? What's your technical support team look like today? And it would be like, well, we have three guys that deal with warranty returns. And I said, okay, so what's going to happen when you get all the, uh, you know, 1-800 numbers calling you to say, I have an issue or my internet's or my device is down. It might be related to the internet. It might be related to the device. You don't really know. Right. And so that's the other, I, I would say, aspect is be really aware of, and I don't care if you're a startup and you have a new concept that you want to do with IoT. Mm -hmm. If you're not aware of what you're signing up for, um, you're going to end up hopefully pro proliferating devices and then being stuck in this mode of, oh no, now what do I do with it? So yeah. those would be the three things that I think are recurring themes over many years now of dealing with this. No, the, so that does make sense. And I think that last point in terms of having a, a clear plan, you know, especially when you scale out these devices um, yeah. and testing and making sure that you can actually, you know, continue to push updates, things like that. That's pretty useful. One of the things that, that you mentioned that, um, uh, that I, I particularly want to dig into is Let's say that let's take a step back, right? Let's go back to retail. Um, if you were to monitor, for example, which is still a pretty big problem today, uh, refrigeration uh, in stores or other such use cases, if some were, some, someone were to come to you from the outside and say, "Hey, um, how should they how should they pitch this to you? How, what are the key things you as a buyer look out for, right? Obviously, you're not enamored by the platform. You've seen enough of those, right? Uh, what are like one or two things that you would say, hey, you know, this this could be real if it passes these two things or these three things. Is there something like that that you could share? Yeah, I think number one is the use case. What are you trying to solve? And it's going to fall into different areas, whether it's productivity or health and safety or reliability. You know, you can you, you can couch it in those terms or you can break it down to energy or maintenance or whatever else it is. So I think one is where's a clear, clear credible use case? Um, and the second thing is, how do you play in the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. And so that's the other thing that I've seen over and over again is, hey, we've got this great new thing around IoT at, you know, with refrigeration or food qualities or relates to, to refrigeration and retail. But it's either trying to displace somebody else or just a, just a lack of awareness around what is the ecosystem that you're living in. And mm -hmm. so. You know, I think that becomes an interesting conversation because if you're not aware of it, then you might have the best device in the world, but you're now running up against entrenched uh, large companies that have been there forever, which makes that use case even harder. And so mm -hmm. understand how you play in the ecosystem. And, and unfortunately, in many markets that you play in, especially with IoT, uh, you might be willing to play in the ecosystem and others might not be willing to play with you. And mm -hmm. so... Having that understanding is really, really critical. So does that mean that the entrenched players have an inherent advantage? I mean, uh, uh, you know, just because of the fact that they already are in the ecosystem. So some of the startups may just have to really think outside the box in terms of the use case and how they're solving it, correct? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, do they have an entrenched uh, um, advantage? Yes, they do. Brand awareness and understanding of the market, everything else. But I also think they have an entrenched um, uh, competitive disadvantage, which is they're not innovating at the same speed as a startup or other uh, people that are looking at the problem from a new and interesting perspective. And so I think that is that is the thing. So, you know, play to your offense and, and manage to your defense, which is we have a better way of solving the problem. Great. Give me an example of what is your better way. And then secondly, um, we're willing to play. How come others are not? And so, you know, IOT, you either have to proliferate sensors, which means you're going to be doing that on your own. But if some of that sensing capability is already there through some of those entrenched players, how do you get access to the data so that you can make your machine work better? Um, so 
I think that's a really important and, and I wouldn't say it's just retail. It's, I've seen that in virtually every industry that we're in is there's always going to be entrenched incumbents that have usually some sort of platform in place. So if you're an IoT startup trying to become a platform, I think you have a much harder time with it. And I would say from a startup perspective, many of the conversations I've had is, do you want to be a hardware provider or a software provider? And usually the answer is, well, I want to be both. And I'm like, I understand that, but being both is much more difficult than saying you want to be both. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I know how companies are evaluated. They're going to be, you know, certainly the valuation on recurring revenue is higher than what might be on EBIT on a straight up line. Mm -hmm. but, but some of the companies that I've seen do really well, they know what they want to be and they know um, that they might have inclinations towards playing in one area, but they're going to start and be very clear about their path. And so I think that's the other aspect is, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up is yep. uh, something that you've got to be able to talk about, demonstrate, and frankly stick to as you go through the process. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I love that aspect of um, somebody coming in and not just saying we're going to displace them, but the story may be better to say, hey, we play along with them. We can take their data and add A, B, and C to that and make that product much better. So because not everybody's always trying to rip and replace everything. And uh, if there's a way to grow that ecosystem, I think that's actually a key takeaway right there. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. And I, I just think um, if you're in a rip and replace mode, you got to understand the customer's willingness to change with that. And, and I think that in any sales process, the hardest thing is, is having a customer become comfortable with the pain of change. And, um, you know, I think, I think the industry is doing a good job of trying to minimize that, but many times we create our own issues. Yep. Makes sense. Um, also you mentioned, um, transformers and Eden, right? So when, yep. when you guys, obviously Eden has been doing IOT for a long time too. Yep. Are there frameworks inside of Eaton when you are considering an IoT project? You you know maybe for a new product line or something. Is there a uh, you know you do you work back from the business case and say you know are you know because at, at the end of the day you have to sell it to some customers that have to buy it from you as a service or whatever the case may be, right? Can yep. you just walk us through some of the thinking inside of how you guys evaluate, uh, a, for example, a new project? Yeah, I think. Um, I would say this traditionally Eaton has been in a very strong engineering company. It still is today. We employ a lot of engineers. And so many times an idea may start from the engineering side of it and try to work its way up. And I, um, I, I try to step in the middle of that and say, all right, what's the business case? Um, yeah. And if you think about the utility world, um, there's a tremendous amount of dumb devices out there, mm -hmm. but those dumb devices have been out there for 40 years and it's a cost competitive game and there's supply chain issues and everything else associated with that. So if you're going to add something that adds additional cost, you better have a very clear understanding of what the revenue model looks like. And you've got to understand CapEx versus OpEx, depending upon the industry you're approaching, because in the case of utilities, um, OpEx becomes uh, uh, dilutive to their profitability, but CapEx, becomes part of the rate base. And so if you want to come in as a recurring revenue model, which is what we all want to do, that's great. But understanding how CapEx and OpEx in the markets that you're serving matter, mm -hmm. um, because you may have to look at it and say, all right, I've got to bundle this into a CapEx solution and, and that may change the revenue model. So I know everybody goes after software as a service or, you know, pick your, pick your letter as a service. Um, understanding what the market sentiment is towards capex and opex is incredibly important so we look at that and mm -hmm. we have the flexibility to take a couple different offers to that i would say so we try to approach it from a business perspective first so you know one is understanding the market trend the market understanding the market penetration what are we trying to do and, and how are we trying to do that i think understanding um also the architecture and hmm. uh, I tend to leverage the open group and their, uh, their tail gap structure. So the architectural framework of the open group, because it's very clear that the business architecture then leads to the technical architecture. And then mm -hmm. the technical architecture will lead to what your solutions are. And I think many times architecture is left until too late in the process. And so architecture for me is probably one of the most 
um, important aspects and also mm -hmm. becoming a big bottleneck in terms of our ability to accelerate and things like that. So unless you're very clear around, you, know, you can break it all the way down, like what should be processed at the edge, what's in, mm -hmm. a, what's in a gateway, what exists at the platform level, and then you know what exists at that enterprise level. If you don't have a very clear understanding of that, or you're trying to tell somebody that you're going to do it all, um, smart people are going to dive into the details there and say, well, yeah. exactly what are you signing up for? On on that same topic of architecture, um, do you guys kind of give any importance to like open source versus closed source, proprietary, not proprietary, more focus on the use case? Just any thoughts there? Yeah, certainly from my perspective, open and agnostic because you have to play in that ecosystem is critical. Um, so I, I think that there is, um, you know, open source, you can run into some legal issues like, hey, if you're using an open source framework, then is your IP um, um, diluted by that approach? But I do think that standards um, around, and, and if there isn't a standard, I always say if there's no standard, then become the standard. Mm -hmm. um, certainly things like MQTT uh, and in a pub sub model become a framework that I think many people are adopting and could, should continue to adopt more of the IT friendly uh, nature of frameworks is better than an engineering centric framework uh, because mm -hmm. guess what, no matter how good your product is and how much it might be related to one part of the business or another, it's usually the IT teams that are implementing and reviewing and scrutinizing what your approach is and, and approving you as a vendor. And so if you're not speaking in IT language and you're only speaking in, um, in you know, one of the areas of the end users relationship, I think you're going to run into problems. Yep. No, that makes sense. It's uh, it's amazing how many folks ignore that and they just think that, oh, IT can come in later. But I think uh, I think you you said it very well. You know, I, and if I can just summarize, you know, uh, it looks like obviously, Ethan, you, you guys have had products out there that have been out there for 40 plus years. You need something that's stable. You need something ultimately that adds business value. Yeah. Irrespective of what engineer thinks it's cool to have or which, you know, which uh, vendor may want to say this is going to be the next best thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that idea of you sitting in there and really evaluating the, the business process and ultimately Closed open source, obviously leading towards open source, but at, at the end of the day, as long as your IT team has approved it, has the right sort of security clearances and all of that, you're you're open to the platform in itself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and you have to be agnostic because you're playing a part of the ecosystem. I will say that one of the big um, aspects that is becoming critical today is cybersecurity. And so, you know, I look at that from two sides of the coin. One is the build it secure. And so, hey, I'm using this chip, I'm using this chipset, I'm using this aspect. But if you ignore the keep it secure, which mm -hmm. I actually think IoT is a perfect use case for when you talk about over the air updates, is what happens if you have um, 20,000 devices out in the field that now you, you know, now a, a vulnerability with that chipset gets exposed? And can you quickly dispatch a patch out to the, mm -hmm. you know, out to wherever your devices are? But being aware of what those vulnerabilities are, how it impacts, you've also got to have a historical record then of what what did we use three years ago versus a year ago versus six mm. months ago. So I think the cyber aspect is is playing a much more prominent role in the decision making as we move forward. And and ultimately, if, if you're part of an ecosystem and you become the vulnerability that gets exposed, um, it, yeah. it's uh, it's no good. Yeah. And, and that's part of the reason why you, yeah, you need that due diligence and you need that, that, um, the larger teams to be involved in, yep. um, quickly sort of switching gears here. Um, really interested in your take on any contrarian views that you may have on IOT. And, uh, I know, I know you're smiling. Looks like you, you, you may I have a few. <laughs> uh, I figured you may have a few to share, but, uh, yeah, let's go, let's go hear that. Go yeah, ahead and hear just, them. Yeah. I mean, from my, the first thing I thought of was uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, <laughs> That's actually a really good one. <laughs> it, oh, you know, boy. It, yeah. You know, I can, great, I can walk into an industrial plant and I can monitor all these things and, and uh, great. Um, now you've just created an issue where you have 400 gigabytes of data every month coming from a large industrial plant. And what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. And how are you going to manage the cost infrastructure of that? And then if you're using cellular, the, the transmit 
uh, and data transport fees. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I know that there's a perspective that yeah. you know that's out there that says, "Hey, if I can just get all the data at some point in the future, I can use it." And I don't, I don't mind that method, but have a hypothesis in mind. Mm -hmm. So you can minimize the pain on the customer, but you can also minimize the pain on yourself. And, and I think yeah. that's a really important thing. The other thing I would say is it's not about the coolness of the features and the devices. It's about how many times the user comes back to it. And I use a home thermostat as a, I think a really good example. So all of the current home thermostats are IoT. Mm -hmm. How many times do you use the app to go back in and check the temperature? It's usually when you're laying in bed and you don't want to move or you're on vacation and you forgot to set back the temperature and so on and so forth. So th there's different monetization paths. Mm -hmm. And how much of it do you really want to invest in cool features that somebody's going to use once or twice? And I could say that just, you know, in your home world, you think about, oh, I'm going to use my lights. Well, are you really? And, and are, are you just going to refer to, uh, you know, Kindle or mm -hmm. uh, like an so. Apple home product to, to yeah. be the router of information to that? Um, I think that's one big thing. And, you know, just reflecting back on the value thing, don't let technology supersede the value. You've got to flip mm -hmm. that around. So, I mean, I, I can get into probably more details about that, but I think from a contrarian standpoint, uh, you know, I don't think yeah. IoT is right for everything. And just because it's there, you know, hammer nail, just because you have a hammer does not mean everything is a nail. Yeah, love that. And I think actually it's uh, it's a lot of value just thinking about, you know, for especially folks as they come in and, and think of a brand new solution. I, I love that use case in terms of just the thermostat. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I only use it exactly like you said, either when I'm in bed and I need to change something or I'm on vacation and I forgot to change the thermostat or you know, whatever the case may be, right? Uh, it very rarely do you do you use that like you know any other times, and it's not. Although all these other features are are pitched, and I think we've all seen how the Google Nest acquisition has gone to. There's not been any new product updates, so yeah, that's that's very useful. Um, in terms of you know IoT or even industrial IoT in particular, I'm I'm interested to understand your views in terms of. Um, what do you think that we have not seen yet that sort of mass adoption? You know, Gartner back when 10 years ago said there'd be yeah. whatever trillion devices and now nobody uses a stat anymore because I think it laughed out of the room. So, you know, nobody opens their presentations with that, with that stat anymore. But uh, um, interested in your, your thoughts uh, in terms of that, why that's, that's not the case right now. And two, you know, where do you see the most amount of growth coming? If, if something has to change, where do you see that happening and where do you see that growth coming? I think the lack of adoption has been due to how you play in the ecosystem. So proliferation of IoT sensors has happened. To what end? And, mm -hmm. you know, so if I've got 35 disparate systems out there all with their own little IoT approach, who's bringing it together? And so I think, frankly, the lack of anybody leading the charge from a system integration perspective mm -hmm then leads to well what are we doing here and so i think there's you know the, the hype cycle i love them i use them all the time you know iot i think isn't that trough of disillusionment right now versus the mm -hmm. peak of inflated expectations and and so i think initially i would say five years ago there was this peak of an inflated expectation i'm gonna add wi-fi to everything i'm gonna add cellular to everything and boy my customers are gonna love me and now it's like well yeah, we did all that. We made those investments. What are we doing with it? And mm -hmm. what's, again, you know, what's the value story there? So I think that's why it hasn't proliferated. And, and many times we get caught up in our own vernacular and we think it's something cool when it's just the new iteration of something that's been done for 30 years or 40 years. And so is there really a stepped level of improvement in terms of how we engage and, and what we're going on? So that would be my perspective on why we haven't seen it. We've mm -hmm. seen a lot of sensor growth, um, but sensors on their own are um, only one part of the, the conversation. Um, yeah. You know, one of the thing I'll just reflect on that, that contrarian, and I think it ties to this a little bit, is data privacy. 
And so when you look at the GPDR standards for Europe and, and some of the regulation they're coming with, they're leading the charge. You have to really look at, you know, they're asking us to look at where is data processed, where is data stored, um, what sort of processing is happening. And, and that may lead back towards a, an environment where on premise mm -hmm. or, at, you know, at a minimum hybrid cloud becomes the standard because you may have the requirement that you got to do all your processing in country. And so I think some of those things are also adding to this. So you're, you're moving into a layer of complexity and regulatory environments where if data privacy, especially around sensing, isn't clear. So passive versus active, what does that mean for data privacy or, or um, the user privacy, I think is going to have a massive impact on how we look at IoT moving forward. Yeah, so I think, I think you know, just to sum that up, if if lead with value, honestly, not not in terms of anything else, and then if there's real value and it handles things like security and privacy, there then automatically we're going to see more of uh, more of these implementations uh, come around, and we're going to see this uh, proliferate. Yep, yep. And then in terms of where do I see some big opportunities? I think in that orchestration level. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll relate it back to the home. I've got there's there's Wi-Fi devices all over the place. Mm -hmm. Who's orchestrating it? And if I've got disparate, you know, I've got a supplier here on my lighting, and I've got one on my thermostat, and I've got another one on my outdoor lighting, and I've got things like that. I don't want to have six apps sitting on my phone that I've got to go yeah. through each one of them. So where's the orchestration? And I I think that's just a big missing gap right now. Like who's orchestrating? You know, the if this then that. Uh, yeah. approach towards, towards, all right, I've got all these things that are out there. Maybe matter makes progress in there. I also think that's where the role of AI will come in, where you don't even have to think about it. It's going to think for you and, and let you know how to coordinate these things. Are, are you, is that a gap even in the enterprise in terms of that orchestration? Um, I think so. Right. I mean, because you, you know, you have all these different kind of IOT systems and, and somebody needs to kind of orchestrate all of those, even at the enterprise, I'm assuming. It, it does. And then, and then, you know, I think enterprises are going to start to look at the revenue models and say, well, why should I pay SaaS at this level and at this level and at this level? Can I collapse that somehow? So I only have one price to pay. And you and I have run into that in our past too, which is you get into a retail environment, somebody wants to monitor their food service equipment. Well, mm -hmm. if I'm coming from five different manufacturers or 15 different manufacturers, and they all have their own IOT version of that. Uh, now I'm, now I'm coming in over the top and I'm saying, I'm going to orchestrate it. They're going to say, well, why am I paying these guys their SAS fees, but you can't shut it off. So yeah. how do you, how do you flatten some of that, that revenue um, stacking and the cost stacking to, to proliferate? So I think that's, um, I don't think anybody saw that yet, but I think that's going to be an emerging issue. No, it's a good point. Um, last but not least, I can't let you go without asking the question of uh, how do you think AI is going to impact IOT? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I think uh, AI is a very broad moniker. Mm -hmm. um, I think machine learning is a matter and, and it will affect IoT, but the question becomes, where do you do the processing? Do you do it on the edge? Do you do it in some sort of middleware or gateway environment? Or are you doing it in the cloud? And depending upon what you're trying to do and where, machine learning plays a big role in that. If you start to attach large language models to it, that's where I think this can really take off. But what large language models are relevant? And so maintenance becomes a big issue. Service becomes a big issue. Mm -hmm. How do you get access to those language models to really intelligently decide what's really happening? And mm -hmm. uh, so I think it, it's going to have a massive impact, uh, Sunder, but I think that where we are right now is still in a lot of investigation and mm -hmm. trial and error phase. So I think AI will have a great proliferation and great growth. Certainly we're seeing it in the data center segment and other segments with GPU explosion, but how do you use it? I think, um, you know, I'll use, uh, I'll use Copilot as an example, and I've got mm -hmm. it in Microsoft, the ability for me to summarize, um, uh, what's happening during a team's meeting after, if I had to miss it because I was double booked mm -hmm. and say recap it for me and tell me what the action items. Well, I'd like to be able to do that to a facility, which is recap what my current state of affairs is in my facility and tell me what my action items are. 
so if if that gets solved and i think it will get solved but it's only solved on a very narrow scope because somebody's not playing mm-hmm. in the ecosystem yep so i'll go back to ecosystem because somebody's you know i can i can be much more highly productive uh without staff if i'm being told you know i, I use this analogy all the time i don't ever want to see another graph again that's a great a point yeah yes so i can go look at a graph and i can go do my own as an engineer sometimes we like to do our own troubleshooting yeah but you're only doing that until there's credibility built but if you can just tell me what the problem is and what i need to go fix to alleviate the problem with some degree of probability that's what i really need and so yeah i'm going to test it and i'm going to validate it with all that data to make sure that you're giving me the right conclusions but at the end of the day tell me what i need to do tell me who needs to do it and what the problem is and we haven't we haven't breached that level of intelligence mm-hmm. if you will that says hey you got a 80% probability that uh, your belt is broken on a drive mm-hmm. you know, and 20% it might be these other things then you use that large language model of the service to confirm that that's real and it becomes more and more and more intelligent and so i think uh, we've got we, we've got we've got a lot of room to grow there and uh, i'm excited about that i think ai is um uh, presents a really, really unique opportunity for us to become much more intelligent. Um, you can't do it off of uh, nothing. So I remember when way back when um, uh, IBM Watson was coming out, and we were approached as the company and they said, hey, we're going to solve all these things for you with applying Watson. And so we gave mm-hmm. them a bunch of data and they came back six months later and they're like, hey, we, we determined that uh, we can tell you this. And it was something we've known in the industry for 20 years. Mm-hmm. So um, if you do it without domain, then it's going to be a bad model. And so the domain expertise has to inform the model and then the model can start to inform itself. But it's not a magic button. There's there's work to be done there. Wow. That's that's really uh, a lot of uh, insights there. Um, I love that aspect of um, AI is going to have the impact, but you have the you need to have the right LLMs from a manufacturing perspective to really add value. I love the aspect of yeah, not necessarily looking at graphs, but where AI can actually make the recommendations for you, like exactly. you said. But to do number two, you got to like figure out the the LLM that's very specific to manufacturing can actually understand the data. And it's interesting. I think I think we've not seen that. I, I haven't seen at least anybody come out and say, "Hey, we're the first manufacturing LLM with some confidence and say we can actually predict that this is exactly." I mean, a lot of people just claim that, but I haven't really seen it. See, like you know, with an actual uh, numbers behind it and, and an actual implementation, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think I think that's key if for anybody listening, is is especially if they're in the AI space to to you know, yeah, uh, kind of work that way or kind of um, approach it in that manner. Yeah, and I think, you know, Sunder, I think it's probably a number of different LLMs depending upon where you are. And so, mm-hmm. you know, one is you go walk a plant with somebody and the inherent domain of the people you're walking around with, they're like, oh, I, you know, hey, look, I, I think I hear something. They're like, oh yeah, that's normal. It's this, 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 it's not a high priority. Being able to capture that knowledge in a, good language model and then being able to leverage that, mm-hmm. that, that takes time. And so, and it might be one from the service company that's supporting you. It might be another one from, uh, from yep. the people on site, but where are we capturing that today? You know, if it's gotta be manual, which is, I've got to go type it into some report at the end of the day, the, the willingness of people to do that is, is going to be low. If it, if we can create a mechanism to capture the ability for somebody to be eyes and ears when they're walking across the plant floor and simply annotate that. And that feeds a large language model that then confirms with the sensor data that we're laying out there for IoT. Now mm-hmm. you can validate a problem, tell them what it is, and then tell them what to do to fix it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. With that, we've uh, come to the conclusion of uh, this uh, episode. Uh, thank you again so much, Paul. As always, uh, amazing insights. And uh, thanks again for sharing sort of that, you know, that buyer perspective in terms of evaluating IoT and and especially with your experience across, uh, you know, um, Emerson, Eaton and, and, you know, even before that. So thanks again. 
No problem. Happy to be part of it. And uh, good luck on your uh, on your business venture. Sounds exciting. Thanks so much.